God is so good. If you have your Bibles with you, let's turn to Genesis chapter 25. We're going to begin reading at 31. Thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Jesus. And when you say have it, say amen. And Jacob said, Sell me this day thy birthright. And Esau said, Behold, I am at the point to die. And what profit, it, profit shall this birthright do to me? And Jacob said, Swear to me this day. And he swore unto him. And he sold his birthright to Jacob. And then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage, porridge of lentils. And he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Then over to Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 16. Lest there be any fornicator or prof or profane, that's right, I got tongue-tied there, person, as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright, for any know how that afterward when he would have inherited the, the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Brother Bond, would you pray? Jesus' name. You may be seated. I'm going to say this, and I may be wrong. I'm not going to be long this morning. The title of my message, Don't Give Up Your Blessing for the Lentils. Do not give up your blessing for the lentils. If you read that first portion of scripture that we wrote or read. Esau was about the age of 60 years old. He was not a young man that was foolish to give up his birthright. He was a very, I'm not going to say an old man, but he was an older man. He was skilled at what he did. God blessed him. But he came out of the woods hungry. And he gave it all up. I want to take a look at him for a moment what a birthright is. Birthright simply is, is in those days, the older son, the oldest, inherited everything that dad had wealth, the livestock, the land, and everything that went with it became dad's. That was dad's became the son's. I'm glad I'm the firstborn. <laughs> That's all right. I don't think it really applies nowadays. But in Hebrews, it says the word meat. But in Genesis, it says bread and lentils. I wanted to know what the word meat, meat meant and that portion. And it literally means to sit down and eat. I was like, okay, that's pretty cool. Sometimes we got to be careful 
that the English language is a little bit different in its meanings of words than other languages are. So we dug in and I found out that it meant to eat. We could look at it and say, oh, Jacob was just a spoiled younger brother that was jealous of what his older brother was going to get. And he threw a hissy fit and figured he'd trip, trip him up or, or be sly about things and say get what he was not supposed to get, get his older brother's wishes. Took advantage of the situation. You know, I've got two younger siblings. Two of them are out here. One's probably watching online. I'm going to pick on them. They were sly and sneaky. They'd always try to get Big Brother in trouble. Always tried to. Mom and Dad were fair most of the time. You know, younger siblings. Who here's, who here's the oldest? Okay, guys. You can be with me. Isn't it always the truth that the younger siblings get away with more than we did? Amen. Amen. Lana? Okay. If Isaac was here, he would agree probably too. That's all I'll be inside. You see, as a parent now, I sit and look at it, and you try to raise your first one, and you're strict. And I'm going to take it from a parent's point of view here for a minute and go, we were always strict with them. You know, you've got to be this way. You want them to sit. And the second one comes along going, it didn't really work for the first one, so why do I got to be so strict on the second one? No, not really. Oh, I forgot Isaac was in the sound, or Sam was in the sound booth. That's not true. No. <laughs> it seems like when you wash down through it, we set the rules high for our oldest. There's nothing wrong with that. But being from the oldest, it seemed like, oh, that wasn't this, the bar wasn't set as high for the younger. But there's no truth to that either. We see what we want to see. Even in, as a Christian, we see what we want to see. Instead of seeing what God is trying to show us sometimes, we lose focus on what the goal is. But I have a God that is a God of second chances. To look at this, we're going to go to Mark. We don't have to look it up. We're just... I'm not even going to read the scripture. I'm just going to reference it to him. Mark 14 and 30. I will read this. Jesus said, Verily, said unto them, Verily I say unto thee, that this day, even in the night, before the cock crows twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. We all know he's talking to Peter. Saying that by, it was when God was being crucified, and their world was upside down. They didn't know what way to turn. That he was sitting by and was noticed by people saying, hey, you are one of them. I hope the land when we get, we're in end times. We're pretty lucky right now, but I believe things are going to get a whole lot worse. And we will get accused, hey, you're one of those. Are we going to be saying, oh, you're crazy. He denied him exactly how Jesus, what Jesus said. And then in Mark 14, 72, Peter recalled to mind exactly the words Jesus said. And at the end of that scripture, he said he wept. You see, Jesus forgives when we mess up. Who's thankful for that? I am so thankful because we are human and we mess up. He knew that when he laid his life down. The disciples didn't quite understand at that time what was happening, even though Jesus explained it to them. He said, this is what I've come to earth to do. This is what's going to happen. And this is why they're going to get happen. And they didn't clue into it. It is so easy for us to be loose focus when we are walking side by side, doing the perfect will of God. 
to sometimes lose the focus of what God is trying to do. Instead of being a help, we become a hindrance. But we also see on down and through the verses that because he denied him, that doesn't mean God gave up on him. How many of us in here have messed up, walked away from God, and come back and God's got them arms right open saying, come to me. See, God, we, we look at it and we see the things we messed up at. I remember one time, I've told the youth this, and maybe I've told you guys this, but I made a mistake. Said something maybe I shouldn't have said. I hurt somebody at work. I'm human. I mess up. I make mistakes. I apologize to them. I ask, Lord, you got to forgive me. You know, I don't like losing the chance to be able to witness to somebody. But if we blow up at somebody, how are we going to witness to them? Because all they're going to see is us blowing up at them. And I felt so bad, and I was, I was in the truck and was driving. I get a chance to pray. and I said, Lord, I'm sorry. He says, why are you saying sorry for it? I don't know what you're talking about. I was like, well, Lord, I just done this. It's under the blood. I don't see it. Isn't that so true? We beat ourselves up. The devil will throw stuff in our face saying, hey, you done this. You did that. Brother Dykeman, I know your testimony, and you've got a powerful one. But the devil likes to throw that past at you. But we've got a God that looks down and says, I don't see that. It's under the blood. Brother Calhoun, Brother Colby, every time we mess up, God looks at it. See, the people get messed up. See, all they see is what they did in the past. That's all they see. God goes, I don't see that. The worst of it is it trickles into the church. We sit there and sometimes that new person walks through the door. And all we see is what they've done. Can I be real? I'm not even going to talk about the church. I'm going to talk about youth. We have new ones come in, and all we can see is what they look like, what they're dressed like. Jesus says they're in my presence. I love them. And if Jesus loves them, that's all that matters to me. That's all that matters to me. He's here to save. We can't do it. But why do I go through things that I shouldn't have to go through? For one, God puts us through the fire to get us pure like gold. If we don't go through it, how, is he, how do we know he heals our bodies? How do you know that if we don't go through things, he don't pick us up and carry us through the trials? If he don't put us through it, how do we know that God can do it? You know, there's some people that if they would have kept their mouth shut in the Bible, they would have lost their blessings and just stayed with the lentils. You know, you look at blind man Bartimaeus. If he wouldn't open up his mouth, even when the crowds told him to be quiet, he wouldn't have been healed. And received his sight. The the lepers. If they wouldn't have said. You know what. We're going to die here regardless. Let's go see what Jesus can do. And they went and God healed them. But of the ten. Only one come back. It's kind of funny. Sometimes God takes care of our situations. But if we forget. And say, thank you, Lord, and praise him for it. Excuse me. Maybe we're missing out on more of a blessing. Because when that one went back, he got that much more of a blessing. Maybe we have to look at it that 
well, maybe we're not going through those quite those issues, but we feel like we're in jail like Paul and Silas. And it's midnight. Sometimes us as Christians can fail to realize in the busyness of life of what is going on. Work gets in the way. It's going crazy. We find excuses not to go to church. We find excuses not to go to prayer meeting. We find excuses not to pray and read our Bible. We find excuses. But at midnight, Paul and Silas sung and sung praises. And they were delivered. I've never been in the middle of a jail and the door swing wide open and I was able to walk out. But in my spiritual world, in my life, I felt like I've been against the wall in the inners of inners of prisons. And God just says, you just start all against all odds. Lord, I need you. I need you. You just start worshiping and praying. I don't care how bad it gets. I'm here to tell somebody this morning, if you will just take the time and praise him, he'll move into the situation. Every one of us in here has been in situations that all we had to do is say, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And he's there, and you feel the presence move into the situation. You feel uplifted. God takes care of it. Let's look at the prodigal son's brother. We talk a lot about the prodigal son, but his brother was a little bit jealous when he came back into the household. And the big party was going on. And he failed to realize that all he seen was the party was for his brother. But he failed to see the blessing and the birthright that was going to be his. We need to be careful, church, to not to get jealous when other people get blessed. We got to be really careful not to get jealous when Brother Goodsell gets a blessing, gets the job that he needs or the healing he needs. Well, why didn't I get mine? I don't know it's God's timing. Keep praying. Or when our lost brothers or grandchildren come in and, and, well, my brother ain't here yet. Keep praying. God's got it. God promised them. Brother and Sister Morehouse, God has promised it. Mom and Dad, God has promised it. Brother Dykeman, God has promised it. We just can't give up on it. We got to stay consistent. In Genesis 27 39, Isaac did pass away. And Isaac, and Isaac, his father, answered and said unto them, Behold, they do, this is Esau wanting his blessing. When his father was on his deathbed. Esau did get a blessing. But maybe it just wasn't what he wanted. He said behold the dwelling shall be. The faithfulness of the earth. And of all the dew of heaven. From above. Esau did have a blessing. It might have not have been all of what it was supposed to be. It may not have been all the land and all the animals that he was supposed to have, but he did get a blessing. In Genesis 33, 4 through 11, we see where Jacob decided he was going to go back to see his brother. Hadn't seen him in years. I sit there and go, how brave he must have been. Not knowing how he was going to be received by his older brother after taking his birthright. He went.
Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him, and they wept. See, he, he come to a point that when he seen his brother, that he missed him, and he welcomed him in. If the music would come. In the end, Esau got the blessing. He didn't see the big picture, maybe, through it all. He took the lentils. But in the long run, his brother gained. He went to him. He gained his family, children, livestock. You see, people do not tell me who I am. The I am tells me who I am. Did you guys get that? People in this world do not tell me who I am. Jesus Christ tells me who I am. See, Jacob, in Genesis 32 and 24 through 27, Jacob was on his way to meet his brother. No doubt, a million and one things going through his mind. But he had a little encounter with an angel. He had an encounter that he seen the I am in a new different way. And he knew everything was going to be all right. See, Jacob got to have an I am experience on his way back to his brother's house. I don't want anybody to not have an I am experience. If you're in this place and you are going through something, I'm telling you that Jesus is in the house. The I am is in the house to meet you there. I don't care what you're going through. You may say, Brother Price, you don't understand. No, I don't. Jesus does. Jesus does. The Bible says this in John 8, 58. Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Revelation 1 and 8. I am Alpha and Omega, beginning and the end, saith the Lord, which is, which was, and which is to come the Almighty. Hebrews 13 and 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If you'll stand with me as we close, I'm here to tell somebody this morning, I don't care what you're going through. Do not give up your blessings for the lentils. Hold on to it. God promised you things. They're going to come to pass don't give up what the world wants you to give it up for. Because there is nothing there on the other side other than brokenness. Because if we know the I am, He's into it. If you go to the I am, He'll intervene. He don't change. That same angel that went to visit Jacob can still come and visit you. Angels don't die. You say, well, Brother Price, I, I don't know if I can go make things right. Pray. Read the Word. The I Am says that you can. I don't know about you guys this morning, but I do not want anything to stand in my way of making it to heaven. Before you this morning, if I have done anything to hurt any one of you or said anything, I'm sorry. I ask for your forgiveness from the depths of my heart if I have done anything. I'm sorry. Because at the end of the day, I just want to see this church filled front to back. I want to see the overflow overflowing. I want to see the youth room packed full. 
I want to see it that we got to go into a building stage. I believe that he's coming again real soon. And our time is getting shorter. I'm bleeding and praying for somebody in this place this morning. Don't give up your blessings just for the lentils. The pastures are not greener on the other side. Sin is yet for a season. But your soul is for everlasting. When Jesus moves into the situation, He just lifts you up. You say, well, it's a mess. He's a great one for fixing messes. Oh, Brother Price, you don't know I'm in the pig pen. That don't matter. Get yourself up. Brush yourself off. There's an altar right here, and Jesus is waiting. I love you, Jesus. These altars are open. Oh, no.